Hi, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Nothing like water problems the day after Christmas, right? Oh, let me tell you. But I am now here with you. And we today are talking about total thyroidectomy and partial thyroidectomies because my TTPT patients, you get, you know, I get a lot of questions. I get a lot of questions from people who have had their thyroid removed or partially removed for whatever reason. We're not going to go down the the rabbit hole of what contributes to or, or results in having a total thyroidectomy, partial thyroidectomy, because it can be nodules, goiters, cancerous nodules, um, cancerous cells found during a biopsy. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Oh, and I should also add in my radioactive iodine patients too, because you don't have a thyroid either. So this is for you. Whatever the reason was, that contributed to or resulted in your entire thyroid being removed or half of your thyroid being removed or a portion of it being removed. We need to talk specifics about what you really need to focus on and what you need to do. Let's start with the basics, shall we? The thyroid gland. We know that the thyroid gland produces both T4 and T3, two thyroid hormones. So the pituitary nudges the thyroid when you had one or when you had it fully intact, nudges the thyroid to produce T4 and T3. Now, the other main function of the thyroid gland itself, it is the main converting organ gland of T4 to T3. So when we're talking about that very important process of T4 to T3 conversion, where the inactive thyroid hormone gets converted into the active thyroid hormone that gets to your cells to give you metabolism and run your entire body and your entire life, that conversion process is very important because if that conversion, that smooth conversion from T4 to T3 does not happen, what will happen instead is T4 will convert to reverse T3. Now, we've talked a lot about reverse T3 on here before, so I won't go do a deep dive special on reverse T3 and all those different factors that contribute to conversion issues. But suffice it to say, if reverse T3 is high, your body is in a survival mode. So we know that reverse T3 is high when you're in the ER or you're in the ICU and your body is literally in one of those states where it says, you don't have to lose weight. You don't have to feel good. You don't have to grow your hair. You don't have to have energy. All you need to do is survive because of whatever trauma or injury landed you there in the ICU, in the ER. Walking around day-to-day -day life, you don't want your reverse T3 elevated. So we want to make sure that that conversion happens very smoothly. So common sense says, if we remove the main gland that does most of the conversion work, then we better look at what it means to pump this patient, you, full of T4. Okay, so let's back up. I just said T4 can decide to convert to free T3, hopefully, fingers crossed, or reverse T3, bad, frowny face. So if it, if it converts to reverse T3 and that puts you in a survival mechanism and the thyroid gland is the most important, the, the, the main gland for conversion, why would we give you T4 only? How does that make sense? Scenario, you're a total thyroidectomy patient or you had radioactive iodine. I give you T4. We cross our fingers and wish on a rainbow that it converts to T3. But we check your reverse T3 and we see that it's elevated in my functional standards, not the standard lab value standards, where you could literally be a 24 and be considered just fine. So we see that your reverse T3 is a 17, you're having issues converting, and let's get to that root cause of why. Well, we removed the main gland that converts T4 to T3. So right there, that's a problem. Now, if some of conversion does happen in the liver, some conversion happens in the gut as well. But in general, we want that main converting organ to be working and it's gone. So we have to kind of improvise from there. So what do I do? I make sure that you have an amount of T3 that at the baseline mimics what your thyroid gland used to produce. So again, recap, we removed the organ that produces T4 and T3. So you no longer have T4, T3 present. You have no ability of making it. 
There is no other organ or gland in your body that will magically produce T4 and T3. And if we do nothing, you will die. It will be a slow, painful death, but all of your organs will shut down and your cells will stop functioning because every single cell in your body needs T3. It needs thyroid hormone. So if we remove someone's thyroid gland and do nothing at all and walk away, they will eventually die. So we remove that thyroid gland that is important for life. And then most of the time, what doctors do is replace it with just T4, which doesn't make sense. That thyroid gland used to produce T4 and T3. So why don't we replace it with both thyroid hormones? Let's replace it with T4 and T3 together because that's what your thyroid gland used to produce. So we'll start there. Then on top of that, another reason why to use some form of T3, and we'll get into that, some form of T3 is back to the conversion. If we remove the conversion organ. Now, luckily, unlike total removal of the thyroid gland and we don't replace your hormones and you die, we can remove your thyroid gland. And if you don't convert well, because we remove the conver main conversion gland, there are other organs, like I said, your liver and your gut that will take over. And some T4 to T3 is even converted in the peripheral tissues and at the cellular level. So conversion can still happen. But in order for conversion to take place, we need thyroid hormone in there. So again, backing up to if we remove your thyroid gland, you're no longer with us. That's a big one. We start with the importance of that. So if you've had a total thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine, we absolutely, my belief system, and this is not the conventional medicine belief, because they are going by standard of care and they will give you T4 only, which completely blows my mind. It's, it's, I mean, dare I say it's borderline medical malpractice because they're not using their heads. They're not using basic physiology that we all know. We all know that the thyroid gland produces two hormones. The thyroid gland does not produce one hormone, folks. It doesn't just produce T4. It produces T4 and T3. And then conversion has to take place. We know that T4 is inactive. We know that all the cells in the body want T3. They have a receptor set on it for T3. So to give a total thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine patient T4 only is borderline malpractice because you could put that person in a very deep hypothyroid state. TSH will come back in that normal range, I guarantee you, because if you if we pump you full of T4 and we keep raising that dose higher and higher, and you've gone from 125 to 200 to 225, and now you're on this super physiologic dose of T4, and your doctor says you're fine because your TSH is in normal range, and they're not looking at T4 and T3. They're not looking at your reverse free T4 and free T3. They're not looking at your reverse T3. They are doing you a medical disservice because you don't even have the capacity to produce your own T3 anymore. It's no longer there. We have removed that gland that produces it. There is no other gland in the body that produces T3 that I'm aware of. If somehow we developed a new mechanism in our bodies please let me know. But to my knowledge, there is no other organ or gland in the body that produces T3. So we have to give it to you. That's, that's my main point. So for total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine patients, it is imperative that you are on some form of T3, be it NDT. So that's your armor, your NP, the, the once and very well missed by most people, nature throid. NDT is natural desiccated thyroid. Now you can get that in medication form. You can also get that in supplemental glandular form. And there are some really good ones out there. I mean, do not get me wrong. I have used the ancestral supplements has a, it's like thyroid and liver, I think it is. It's a glandular. It's a glandular. So they use bovine. NDT prescription medication uses porcine. So they're getting it from beef thyroid glands. NDT, the makers of armor, the makers of NP thyroid, they're getting it from dried pig thyroid glands. And sometimes there is a difference. I do have some patients that actually fare better on the beef, on the glandulars, on the, the supplemental forms of glandulars. But at least one way or another, they're getting that little bit of T3 in the system to skip the middleman of, of relying on the body to convert all of this T4 into T3 we give you a little bit of T3, we skip the middleman, 
And then your cells go, oh, thank you. Thank you, because this is what we wanted. We just want a little bit of T3 because somebody took out the gland that produces it. So we're very, very happy to receive a little bit of T3 in the system. Now we can also use just straight up, and now remember, now I call it Biosynth. We can use the Biosynth form, Cytomel, Leothyronine, that is T3. Now we can use that with all that T4 that they're pumping into you. We can lower your T4 dose and add in some T3. That makes you really happy. And some thyroidectomy patients require T3 only as well. This is T3 only therapy is not just for those of us that have a thyroid gland or have a kind of partially destroyed thyroid gland because we've had Hashimoto's. It's, it's, it's for all of us. It is for all of us. So if you are a non-converter and we can find that out through either elevated reverse T3 that doesn't come down or just trial and error. When we give you T4, you get worse. When we take it away, you get better. You might be T3 only, but either way, whatever dose you're on, I don't care if it's 10 micrograms, 25 micrograms, 150 micrograms of T3, we have to add in T3. Now, my partial thyroidectomy patients, you still have a little bit of your thyroid gland left. You still are producing a little bit of T3, but that doesn't mean that we leave you in the dust. We still have to replace those thyroid hormones that are no longer being made. And I actually just talked to a patient today. She had a partial thyroidectomy, and then she actually had a virus that attacked the other half of her thyroid. We didn't get into it. She's, she's signing up with me new, so we didn't get deep into her medical history until her initial consult. But she just said that to me over the phone at our, our first talk. And I found that interesting. I don't know exactly what virus it is, but she basically does not produce any T4 or T3 on her own. And of course, her current doctor has her on, thank God, armor thyroid, but about enough armor that is, you know, for a large dog. I always say five micrograms of T3 is enough for your cat. She, she has about enough T3 in her armor dosing for a large dog, but not for a human being to run a body. So for my partial thyroidectomy patients, it is as imperative to get that T3, that active thyroid hormone in the system, because you don't have half of your thyroid or whatever portion they took of it, a quarter, a half, two thirds, three quarters, whatever it might be. And for whatever reason, we need to have T3 in the mix. Now let's take it one step further. Let's say you had a total thyroidectomy due to cancer. It is even more imperative that we keep that TSH suppressed. I actually did have a patient the other week that is a thyroid cancer survivor. For those of you with thyroid cancer, very easy to treat, but it's very imperative that the, the medication, the dosing, the thyroid hormone replacement therapy that occurs after the fact is optimized. And one of those things that I look for in my cancer patients is that we keep that TSH suppressed. And her doctor actually was happy with her TSH at a two. That is not acceptable. That is acceptable for non-cancer patients. So optimal TSH is below a two. And many functional practitioners out there will say, well, I really like it between a one and a two. You know what? I don't care if it drops below a one. Because again, going back to basic physiology, if I give you T3, your hypothalamus and pituitary message, message that happens, the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary, pituitary talks to the thyroid, that HPT axis that occurs, that message center that occurs, is sensing that there is enough thyroid hormone in the body, it's not going to scream at the thyroid gland. Now we still watch TSH, whether you have a thyroid or not, because we want that low, low, low. We do not want the pituitary sensing by any way, shape or form that it needs to yell at the thyroid gland that is no longer there. It's still gonna send out TSH. It is still going to send out thyroid stimulating hormone because TSH is not a thyroid hormone. So just because we take your thyroid doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to your TSH anymore. Eh, you know, I don't pay attention to TSH in most people, but in post-cancer patients, I do because I want that suppressed. I don't want to see that increasing because thyroid tissue could grow back if that TSH is not suppressed. Again, because the, the pituitary starts yelling at the thyroid. We don't want any tissue regrowth in post-cancer patients. Again, I said I wouldn't go down that rabbit hole as to the why, but I wanted to at least touch on that because many of you had a total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine, or partial thyroidectomy because of cancer. Many of you have had that because you have had 
Graves' disease. And the big thing with Graves' disease, and I know I'm kind of, I'm, I'm getting a little off track, but not really. The big thing with Graves' disease and, and all of my patients that start with Graves, you always go hypo because they're going to do something. They're either going to remove your thyroid gland, take half of it out, or they're going to put you on methamazole that is going to put you into a hypo state. Many doctors don't test TPO and TGA antibodies in Graves' patients. Test them. Nine times out of 10, they're there. And I don't know why this happens with Graves patients. They get kind of put into this Graves disease box, which is, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Graves disease is the autoimmune form of hyper ER thyroidism. But we have to treat it because if we don't want your heart racing. We don't want you going into tachycardia. We don't want your eyes bulging out of your head. We do have to treat it. There are natural ways to treat it as well. But I normally see people after the treatment, when they've fallen back into that hypo state, many, many, many doctors will not test TPO and TGA to see if there are thyroglobulin or thyroperoxidase antibodies, aka Hashimoto antibodies. When there's autoimmune, there's autoimmune. Graves patients will fall and swing into hypo, into Hashi. It just, that's what happens. So we have to test those antibodies for Graves patients, but that does not change the treatment protocol. If you have autoimmune, I'm going to tell you to go gluten-free hundred percent. If you don't have autoimmune, I'm going to tell you to go gluten-free 90%. So it's not going to change the treatment protocol. I'm still going to use T3 with you because it just works because only one out of a hundred patients do well on T4 monotherapy. So we're, we're still going to treat you the same. And my goal is still the same. My end goal is still the same is to get you optimized. My point being is that if you are a Graves patient, I want you to get those antibodies tested so we can see. That was just kind of a side note. So if you are a Graves patient, you had a total thyroidectomy, partial thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine, because they believe that chemically blasting your thyroid is the right thing to do. I want you to know that's okay. It's not the end of the world. I also have had patients say, man, I really wish I wouldn't have gotten my thyroid out. Or I really wish I wouldn't have gotten radioactive iodine. Listen, it's done. We can't go backwards. Let's deal with the situation that we have right now. You can get optimized. We just have to get your numbers where they should be and get your medication right. So we have to medication, i.e. thyroid hormone replacement therapy. We have to replace those hormones that are no longer being made by the once they're, once partially their thyroid gland. Let's use T4 and T3. Now let's get you into the optimal ranges. So like I said earlier, TSH, we like below a two. Post-cancer, way suppressed. And here again, basic physiology, it's going to go suppressed even more when you're on any kind of T3. It could, TSH can become suppressed even on T4 only. But definitely once we add in the T3, that bad boy is going down. Free T3, we like 3.5 or above or in the upper quadrant of the range for any of my people that are listening from a different country. You guys have different lab value ranges. Even here in the US, our lab value ranges can, can differ a little bit, even from lab to lab. So we want you in that upper quadrant of the range. And then free T4, I like 1.5 or above, but dot, 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 but I don't really care about your free T4 as long as your free T3 and reverse T3 are optimal. Free T4 will naturally go down a little bit, especially on T in T3 only patients like myself. T4 is basically non-existent, very, very low. It's only technically picking up what is left of my thyroid gland after being destroyed by Hashimoto's. So my T4 is very, very low. Do I care? No, because my reverse T3 is below a 12, which that is the optimal range. Even in different countries, that reverse T3 range is pretty much the same. So if you do have, happen to have a, a, a not zero to 25 reverse T3 range, then I'm going to say I want it in the bottom half, the bottom half of that range. So yes, you could be normal from here to here. We want you here to here in that bottom half of the range. So reverse T3, we want low. If free T3 and reverse T3 are optimal, don't really care about the free T4. But it, it, it's just that that's where that, that free T4 comes in in a very individual basis. 
that's where I look at it and I go, okay, well, you're converting fine. Again, patient earlier today, looked at her labs that just came in. She's on armor. I looked and her reverse T3 is beautiful. It's like a nine. Free T3, mm, still 2.6. Free T4, 1.1. PSH suppressed, point whatever, two, five. So what do we do? We're not just going to add in T3 because she's converting just fine. We're going to start with increasing her dose of armor per. She's on much too low of a dose. So that's what we're going to start with. And then I'm going to watch that reverse T3. Again, free T4 can go up to 1.5 and be beautiful. But if that reverse goes with it, hmm, we're pulling back down on the T4 dose and then we're adding in T3. So that's the, kind of my example of why I don't hang my hat on the free T4 number being optimal. Again, it's kind of a, a value to shoot for. But at the end of the day, I want your free T3 and your reverse T3 optimal. And I want you to be symptom free. Isn't that the most important part? Those four, those four words that I always say that you guys don't hear enough from your doctors. How do you feel? How do you feel? So if you still are suffering with symptoms and your numbers are perfect, guess what? I got to put on my thinking cap and I have to go, oh, I, I see this all the time. So it's not a big thinking cap because again, it's basic physiology and personal experience. I'm going to say, okay, well, if your free T3 is a 3.5 and you still feel like garbage, your optimal might be higher. Your optimal might be like mine, like a five or a six. So your optimal dose is something that we have to find together. But neither here nor there, we just keep trying until we do. Total thyroidectomy, partial thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine patients, you're not going to fare well on T4 only. That is my message to you. We absolutely have to add in that T3 in, in one way or another. Whether it is NDT, whether it is the biosynth, whether it is the glandular form in, in supplements, one way or another, we have to get in T3 into your mix, preferably in the medication route, because you're going to be on medication anyways. Why not get you on just that state where we know with a little more certainty, a little more certainty what is actually in each pill that you're taking. Whereas supplements, there's no regulation, nor do we ever want them to be because the FDA will magically F up anything they get their hands on as we can see right now. So we don't want them touching our supplements. But that also means that we're not 100% sure. No, I mean, you could be like 90% if you're going with a really good company. But we're not 100% sure of the absolute micrograms of glandular in each and every dose and each and every capsule. Still in all, glandulars are fine, especially if you're stuck. If you're stuck, 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 then the glandulars are fine. If you can't do pork, then the glandulars are fine. If you're stuck and you can't do pork, the glandulars are fine. But ultimately, if you were my patient, you said, I can't do pork and I have a total thyroidectomy, then I would use leothyronine cytomel. Huh, okay. I know I covered a lot. I want to get to questions because we have a lot going on and I might even get some more um, stuff to say because I didn't want to dive too deep into a rabbit hole, but I did want to cover that. So, okay. Hi everyone. Thank you for jumping on. So one uh, comment that I'm seeing is she feels like she's suffocating. He, she, Sam. I feel like I'm suffocating. So that could be, again, Sam, I don't know if you've had a total thyroidectomy, partial thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine. I don't know what's going on in here, but we do know that when the thyroid, if you have a, still have a thyroid gland and that's enlarged, many, many patients will feel that tightness in their throat. They'll feel like they can't get that deep breath in. They'll feel like they are suffocating, like you said. Now, if you have had that, then my concern would be inflammation for you. So if you don't have a thyroid gland, you still feel like you're suffocating, then my concern would be inflammation. And my question would be, are you on the right dose of medication? Because when we, when, when we put the right amount of thyroid hormone in, this isn't just about giving you a metabolism. I don't want you to think of thyroid hormone as just revving your engine, giving you the ability to burn fat, giving you metabolism, giving you energy. Yes, it does all of those things because it acts at the cellular level. It's part of the ATP Krebs cycle. It helps our mitochondria function and actually produce energy. 
But going even further than that, it does help our body with reducing inflammation. Now, inflammation can also reduce thyroid function and can impair T4 to T3 conversion. But having an optimized thyroid, think about this. Having an optimized thyroid, and we always talk about thyroid at the top, trickling down insulin. What do I always say about insulin? Insulin is a huge inflammatory marker. If you have high insulin levels, you are inflamed. You are walking around with a crap ton of inflammation. If you want to age quickly and die of either cancer or a neurological disease, keep your insulin high. You'll also have wrinkles and you'll be overweight. So insulin in and of itself is inflammatory. So if we optimize the thyroid gland and then insulin signaling improves and that insulin levels come down, insulin level comes down, so does inflammation. So it just, it goes to show that just by optimizing your thyroid, Sam, you might see an improvement in that feeling, but we don't exactly know what is triggering that feeling of suffocating. Donna, you had a radioactive iodine. For, I didn't know that for hyperthyroidism a few years ago. Why didn't I know that? Given T4 only. Yeah. Adjusted based on TSH. <laughs> That's all mainstream doctors are taught. I was miserably kept in a continuous hypothyroid state based on T4 only plus TSH. Got 100% better on NDT plus T3. That's a great, oh, thank you for sharing because I didn't know that. That, that you had RAI for hyper, no idea. Um, so that is, I mean, that's everything that I'm talking about right there. T4 only is going to keep you in that hypo, hypo, hypo state. Once you get, once you optimize, and Donna is optimized, once you optimize a person, and, and again, this is the perfect example too, NDT plus T3. We don't have to, we're not stuck in one box. We're not stuck in the T4 only box. That's for damn sure. And we're not stuck in the NDT box. So if you're on NDT, which does contain T3, and you're not feeling better, we can absolutely add in T3. So we can do this combination like Donna's on of NDT plus T3 to get you to that point of optimization, be it in the numbers and in the symptoms. The thyroid also converted some T4 into T3. Without a thyroid, you've lost some ability to convert. Yeah, we talked about that earlier when we first started talking, removing the thyroid gland, you're removing the main, the main conversion gland. Now, again, yes, T4 can be converted in the peripheral tissues in the liver and the gut. There are other ways that our body can convert T4 to T3, but without a thyroid gland, you are, yeah, I mean, we, we talked about that. You're, you're taking away the body's main source of conversion. So, I don't know. I'd like to try to think of some analogy to go with this because you know I love analogies. <laughs> but all I'm coming up with is if you had a gas-powered car and I took away all the get-cos and sheets and you were forced to have one gas station in the middle of the United States or use the multitude of plug-ins for the hybrid Tesla electric cars, you'd be screwed. You'd have to get to that one gas station in the middle. I don't know. That's not a good analogy, but that's what I'm kind of thinking of, right? Because you have this machine that wants to run and we're taking away the ability to have gasoline, to have fuel, to have that T3, to convert T4 to T3. We're taking that away. So unless we give you more gas stations, unless we give you that T3, then, then you're forced searching. Your body is searching and trying to convert the T4 that the doctors are giving you into the active form T3. Okay, next question. I had a partial thyroidectomy for suspected diagnosed cancer. I'm on 60 milligrams of NP plus five, I think you mean to say micrograms of cytomel. TSH is 0 0.084, going to happen. NP has T3, plus you're on cytomel, that is T3. My free T3 and free T4 are still at the bottom, way below optimal. How do I know whether to raise NP or the cytomel? Well, so you need the reverse. Nancy, you need the reverse T3 because that's going to tell us your conversion and how well you are doing. 
So if there are, and the, the factors that interfere with conversion, and we can list them really quickly without going deep diving into them, estrogen dominance, insulin resistance, high insulin, that will impair low zinc levels, low iodine levels, low magnesium levels, low selenium or elevated selenium, because a lot of you have elevated selenium because you heard somewhere that selenium is great for the thyroid and you're taking too much every day. And then your selenium raises too high. So high selenium can interfere as well. Anemia, low ferritin, all of these contribute to elevated reverse T3, as does you being on possibly too much T4. Now I would say for a partial thyroidectomy, 60 milligrams of NP plus five acetamol is not enough just on the surface, just as I'm looking at it. And the fact that you still have low free T3 and low free T4, that's kind of nudging me to increase at least the NP, if not both, but we need the reverse T3 to really tell whether or not that is something that we should do. I had no choice for RAI. I was in the Navy. Listen, I get it. A lot of you don't have a choice because like I said earlier, Marty, you might be in this position. You know, it could have been years ago. Uh, people like myself were not out yet. You didn't have this kind of information at your fingertips. And even if you did, you can sometimes be in this place of being scared. Like I talked about earlier, if you have Graves disease and you're, you're hyper and your heart's racing and you, you don't want thyroid eye disease, you don't want your eyes bulging out of your head because then that's another surgery to even put them back in and get them set properly. You don't want to go through that. So I don't blame you. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have had it. I'm not saying that to anybody. But what I am saying is now that now that it's you're in this place, and this podcast is specifically for you, you're in this place, now let's do something about it to make sure that you're optimized. Let's adjust that medication. Let's get you into that optimal state. And, and Marty, if you're on T4 only, I'm calling BS. I'm calling medical malpractice because if you have, have had RAI, you do not have a thyroid anymore. Everything that we just talked about, you can't produce T4 and T3 and you lost your conversion, your main conversion gland. So it's even more important that you get optimized. Okay. So Maureen, if you had a total thyroidectomy for grief and you still get antibodies checked, that's what we were saying earlier. So get the, yes, still get the antibodies checked because I still see antibodies even post thyroidectomy and post RAI. And then, yeah, Donna chimed in too. I was actually just going to ask you this, Donna, but you chimed in. Yes, a total thyroidectomy only removes the thyroid, which is the victim of Hashimoto's or Graves autoimmune condition. You still have the autoimmune condition. So autoimmunity is your body's, I don't want to simplify it. I always say your body's just confused, right? So we can all have a genetic predisposition for autoimmune. And we know that autoimmune begets autoimmune, where we see one, we see more than one. So if you've had Hashimoto's or Graves, and you have been diagnosed with that, we knew, we know, and we knew at one time because of the diagnosis, we know you have antibodies. We absolutely want to check those antibodies because if they are high, they can spur on other autoimmune conditions. So that's where we see celiac and Crohn's disease and psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS. So yes, we absolutely want to check your antibodies because as Donna was saying, those are still present. Though They can still be present. Now we can do things to lower them. We can use low dose naltrexone. We can use black cumin seed oil. We have to make sure that you're on a gluten-free diet. All those things that contribute to elevated antibodies, we have to put into place to make sure that you're doing all the things as well as optimizing thyroid and using the proper medication, T4 and T3 medication for you to get you in an optimal state. That also helps antibodies. But yes, you definitely want to still get those tested. Rebecca, I had a partial thyroidectomy four years ago. By the way, thanks for all these comments and questions because this makes it really fun. I had a partial thyroidectomy four years ago. I'm on no med... What? You're on no medication. I'm on no medication. I'll read your question before I inject emotion into this. I'm, I'm on no medication. As they said, my levels were normal. At one time, my TSH was 3.08. I've never felt properly well. No kidding. S since and struggle with joint pain, brain fog, headaches. 
my doctors just put it down to chronic fatigue, but I know it's the operation. Definitely very frustrating girl. You cannot, what did we just say? I hope you listen to this whole thing. We cannot take out all or even part of your thyroid and not put you on medication. Actually, this is a very good point because you brought up something that I forgot. I have had patients that have had a partial thyroidectomy. And yes, their doctors will test their levels and they're only go by TSH as yours is. And that TSH isn't even optimal. I like it below a two. But that's the problem is that doctors will say, but your levels are normal. You don't need medication. Again, let's revisit basic physiology. Thyroid gland, producer of T4 and T3. If we take half of it away, if I take half of your car, are you going to get to work? You could do a Fred Flintstone. But you're probably not going to get there on time. I'm taking away, if I take out half of your engine, which is essentially what the thyroid is. If I take out half of your engine, is your car going to run? I mean, this is, mm, this is common sense. And not for you, but for doctors, this is common sense. So if I take away half of your car, things are not going to work properly or as they should, which no wonder you, I mean, you have all of the hypo symptoms. You have all of them. Well, you didn't say weight gain, but yeah, there's the weight gain and the fatigue too, which I'm sure you have, you just didn't list. Oh, Miss Rebecca. Yes, it is absolutely, absolutely imperative, imperative. Oh, did I know it, Donna? I probably just forgot. You know, I it just people and where they started and where they just all gets bejumbled. So I apologize. I probably did know that. Um. You need your actual thyroid hormone levels tested, free T3, free T4, reverse T3. TSH is not a thyroid hormone. Yep, we said that. TSH does not determine how hypo you are. So, Ms. Rebecca, yes, you have to move on beyond the TSH. Like Donna said, you have to get the free T3, free T4, reverse T3 tested. That's the only way. And, I mean, we can kind of determine by your symptoms. So I could place a, a, a bet on what those numbers are going to be. Your free T3 is going to be low based on your symptoms. I don't know about your reverse T3, if, that's, if that has gone high or not in response to not being replacing the thyroid hormones that aren't there anymore, i.e. medication, not being on medication. Um, it's, it's very hard to tell. So you need all of those tested, but I bet your free T3 is low. If I am only on Levo, does this contain T3 and T4? No, it does not. So your T4 only meds are your Levo, Lavoxyl, Synthroid. Um, there's a couple other ones from like the UK and Australia, but those are T4 only. Tyrosent, T4 only. Those do not contain T3 and T4. Natural desiccated thyroid medications contain T3. And then your straight up T3 is either generic leothyronine or the brand Cytomel. Okay, Nancy got back to us and said reverse T3 is 13.3. So that's kind of right on the edge. I really do prefer it less than 12. But if you're if you're checking all of the things like selenium, ferritin, iron, um, insulin, all of your hormones, and all of those are normal, then I my first inclination in a case like this. My first inclination would be to increase the NP. Um, but again, and you're not my patient, I can't get too specific, but that just based on those numbers and the kind of the what if scenario, that's where I would go first and then kind of monitor from there, possibly adding in T3 down the road. Okay, now we have someone that has been on methamazole for more than three years. I was in remission for only three months. So I was off methamazole for those months. Then the endo said I must have my thyroid removed or take the radioactive pill. I saw a new endo. He put me back on methamazole. Asked if I was aware I also have graves. The endo I was seeing never mentioned graves. I don't know what to do, where to go. I live in California. I'm looking for a good, There's no good endos out there. Um, Noemi. I think I'm saying that right. Noemi. Uh, yeah, no good endos out there. So I have, I mean, I've been in practice for, I think, 26 years now. I'm not dating myself. 
And I do, I, ha I have patients in the UK, Australia, South America, Egypt, United States, Canada, and oh, Hawaii, but that's part of the US. And I have not, I have three good endos on my list. Actually, one just got kicked off a few months ago. So I have two good endos on my list in 25 years in multiple countries. In general, endos are not good at managing thyroid conditions. So, um, Noemi, I, myself and my team can prescribe out to California. So if you would like to book a discovery call, we can definitely help you out there. I'm sorry that you've been on this swinging pendulum kind of roller coaster with medicine and endos, but this is not that hard. And, and that's the thing. Thyroid conditions are not that hard. I think the medical system make them harder than they have to be. And they at least make you as a patient more crazy than you have to be. It, it, it shouldn't be that way. Most cases are very black and white to me. They're cut and dry. They're easy. Of course, every so often there'll be someone that is you know, a hormonal disaster and they're filled with mold and heavy metals and, you know, this and that off the charts. And there's all these different things that we have to do with them. But most of the time when we're looking at hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, Gray's disease, in your case, Mimi, it, it's black and white. It's right there. I, I, I know what to do. We implement it and people get better. And yeah, it might take a while. I'm not saying it's a magic pill, like all of a sudden in a week, do, 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 you're better. But over time, yes, you can get optimized and you can live a really fun life and you can have treats at, at Christmas and not gain five pounds like you're doing right now by looking sideways at a brownie. So I promise you the energy is there. The metabolism is there. It is easier than the roller coaster that you've been on. And I think many of you, because you have been through the ringer, you think that you're a tough case. You think that this is impossible. Nobody's going to know what to do. And believe me, by the time I, I talked to somebody the other day that is signing up with me and she said, well, you're, you're basically my last hope. I said, I am the last hope of 99% of my patients and that's okay. I will gladly take that on because I know what to do. And, and I don't mind having that, that badge. It's a badge of honor. Yes, I will be your last hope. I just don't understand why someone like yourself has to go through that much pain and suffering to get an answer that is right there in front of me. So just so you know, Noemi and all of you listening, it's not that hard to get optimized. Even if you don't have a thyroid gland, it is not that hard. It's called replacing thyroid hormones that aren't there and listening to you as a person with your symptoms. I'm not going to leave you somewhere because your numbers look good. Because again, maybe your optimal is outside of that range. And I'm open to that because mine is, mine is, Dr. Weston Child's wife is, him and I are going to get together again. We're going to talk about that. We're going to do a lot, big q and in a in a few weeks. But yeah, I mean, we, we can't be stuck in a box and we can't put you in a box. Just because, and please, I mean, if we don't see the fallacy of standard lab value ranges, what do we see? I mean, we already know that the TSH alone has been debated for decades. It used to go up to a 10 and some doctors are still there. Some doctors won't even call you hypo unless you hit a 10 and functional wants you below a two, but on that lab value range, so it went from a 10, then people argued and it, doctors argued and it got moved down to a six. And now it's a zero to 4.5, 4.5 is the cutoff. But again, in functional medicine, we're saying below a two, below a two. So we can see the error by boxing people into a standard lab value range. And, and I'm very aware of that as well with my patients, because your optimal for T3 might be above that standard lab value range. Okay. I'm going to grab a couple more. Before we go, can a clean diet fix most thyroid and or autoimmune issues? What causes Graves' disease in the first place? So let me start with that one. What causes Graves' disease? Same thing that causes Hashimoto's. It's 
a genetic predisposition. So if you listen to Alessio Fasano, brilliant man, and Alessio, that will also, Maureen, kind of help you gu gu help guide you in what diet is good for, not fix, but it is good for autoimmune conditions. So with any autoimmune condition whatsoever, think of it as a three-legged stool. You have that genetic predisposition. So you have that familial genetic um, predisposition, just like I said, to, what do we want to say, um, to kind of uh, process an autoimmune disease. So with that genetic predisposition, it doesn't say, yes, you're definitely going to have autoimmune. We just look at it and go, hey, you know what? Your mom and your grandma and your aunt and your sister all have Hashimoto's, but the doctors are telling you that you don't. Chances are pretty good that you do. Because you have a thyroid condition, we know that you're hypo and your entire family has an autoimmune condition. And I've even seen like autoimmune disasters. I have seen MS, lupus, type 1 diabetes, Graves, hypothyroid, I mean, all in one big family. Oh my gosh, this is like an autoimmune ball of fire. So you start with that genetic predisposition, and then you add on leaky gut. So what causes leaky gut? We know that gluten does. So you add on leaky gut. These are toxins. This is excess intake of gluten and sugars that causes perforations in your gut, in your gut wall, and allows lipopolysaccharides to basically seep out. I know it sounds gross, but seep out into your system. And then you get that systemic inflammation. And then that third leg of the stool is a stressor. So this is where we see autoimmune conditions present themselves after a major stressor. And this stressor could be something very natural, like puberty, pregnancy, menopause, hormonal changes, or it could be from over-exercising, over-dieting. It could be from a traumatic event, like a car accident, death in the family, a divorce, that kind of thing. Um, God forbid, loss of a child, things like that, that. Those are those markers in life where we can talk to a person and say, okay, if you go back, when did all your symptoms start? And they will say, you know what? It's after my second kid. Or I, I do have a lot of teenagers, usually late teens, early twenties that have thyroid conditions and there, we can trace their symptoms back to puberty. Those hormonal changes that created a stressor, quote unquote, natural stressor, but still a stress in the body. Being pregnant is a huge stress on the body. Yes, it's natural, but it's a stressor. So all of those markers along the way can be those times where the autoimmune condition presented itself. The switch flipped into the on position. Now, can a clean diet fix most thyroid or autoimmune issues? Uh, I'm going to say a yes or no on that. It's going to help. So this is where my both and philosophy comes in. We cannot, I can't produce more T3 in your body. I could put you on the best diet in the world. I mean, it could be perfect to a T, 100% organic. That can even be low carb. And I'm not going to magically produce T3 in your body. What it is going to do, especially if it's gluten-free, it is going to lower inflammation, which will lower antibodies, but we don't hang our hat on the antibodies. And this is kind of another topic for another time, but it's very important to mention because many people will say, well, my antibodies are at zero, so I must, I must be okay. I go, how do you feel? I'm like, oh, I feel, still feel like crap. I'm like, well, then you're not okay. And it doesn't really matter if the antibodies are at zero because your antibodies could be at 100 and I could have your numbers optimized and I could have you feeling better and all your symptoms down and those antibodies will eventually come down, but I'm not going to diagnose you based on antibodies because I have somebody right now with antibodies at six and nine, she feels like absolute garbage. So what if I looked at her antibodies and went, well, they're low, you know, they're almost zero. You should be, you should be fine. We're just going to leave that alone. No, the most important markers, again, free T3, reverse T3, and free T4. Those are your most important markers that we want to look at. We glance at the antibodies. Do I want to see them down? Yeah. Do I want to see them at, you know, 3,000? No. Oh, I, I want to work at getting those down. But we're not going to hang our hat on the antibodies. So the diet will help. But a, a perfect diet is not going to improve thyroid. Flip side, I can be working at getting your antibodies down. I could have you on the right medication. We can be optimizing you. And if you're hitting McDonald's every day, 
that's not going to work either. So there is the both and philosophy. Both things have to be done together in order to get you into that optimized state. All right, ladies, I need to get going. I have my group program next. So ladies and gentlemen, I should say. So thank you so much for jumping on today. I greatly appreciate it. I greatly appreciate all of your questions. And as usual, please share this. You can share this on Facebook, but this will be coming out tomorrow as a podcast. So if you're not yet subscribed, make sure that you subscribe to the Thyroid Fixer podcast on all podcast platforms. And um, going back to Noemi, you can go on to my uh, website. Oh, I am saying your name right. Yay. So Noemi, you can go um, on my website and click on book a call and you can book a free discovery call. And then we can go over all of that for you with you being in California. That's not a problem. We got California covered. So we got you covered, girl. I want you to have some hope, okay? All right, so definitely reach out to me, contact me. I'll put the link. Um, if you happen to jump off, I'll put the link in the comment section so you can so you can book a call as well. All right, guys, talk to you soon.